Good afternoon, friends. Stephen Benoon here with Israeli News Live. This video you're looking at right now, these two uh, horses in Great Britain that kind of got loosed running through the city, one white, one black, and of course the white one kind of looks like he's drenched a little bit in blood there. It looks like maybe he ran into a vehicle, something of that effect there. But nonetheless, there you go right there. We can see all the, the blood on him there. This video clearly has inspired me as I was watching the video, suddenly it just come upon me who those horse riders are in the book of Revelation. Specifically, chapter 6, where it talks about the horse riders. Now, there are seven seals. And we know, according to Revelation chapter 5, John was weeping very bitterly because there was no one found in heaven, no one on earth, that could take the book and lose the seven seals thereof until one had came forth that had been slain like a lamb. And that was, of course, Jesus Christ. And he loosed the seals and actually revealed those seven seals, what's written in there. But again, it's kind of like a parable. And uh, knowing that Jesus only spoke in parables, he looses it. He actually says what was written in those seven seals there. But the question is, is what does it actually mean? And I believe that by God's grace, I might be able to help us out today in knowing exactly who they are, who the four horse riders are. And then the last seals there, uh, fifth, sixth, and seventh seal, will begin to make more sense to you. So let's get right into this there. Like I said, that just was such an inspiring video there. I want to thank Sister Rosa for sending that to me. And uh, we're going to look at all this. Uh, this here is chapter 5, as I mentioned to you, John. You know, he wept, or excuse me, that's chapter 6. Sorry, we are in chapter 6, uh, chapter 5 here. And I saw the right hand of him that sat on a throne, a book written within, and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And by the way, that ought to throw people off when he says under the earth, right? Mm, wow, gosh, golly gee. Sounds like, well, I'll leave it alone. Too many people are so excited about a flat earth. Don't want to upset them there that the Bible speaks of that. Anyway, and I wept much because no man was found worthy to open or and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book, to loose the seven seals thereof. And I behold, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and the four and beasts in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand that sat on, upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps of golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints." And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for you was, were slain and have redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation, and has made us into our God kings and priests. Interesting, isn't it? They're kings and priests, and yet they're from every tongue, every kindred, every people, and every nation. Now, there goes the whole idea of the Levitical priesthood, right? Hmm. Interesting. All right. Now, I want to get into these uh, these seals here now with you and uh, just kind of, and I, I'm going to just kind of highlight this for you today because uh, I'm still digging even deeper. There is so much that come to my heart when I started seeing this, not even funny. But let's start right here. Revelation chapter 6, verse 1, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder. That's not thunder, but it's the noise as it were thunder, right? One of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse. He that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. And, you know, traditionally, I always thought it was the Pope of Rome because he's given a crown. He goes forth, he's conquering, and he's uh, conquering and to conquer. He's got a bow with him, you know. So it just seemed to make sense, right? But I never thought that the very real possibility that that first horse rider could very well be the, 
the, the British Empire. Because after all, the British Empire, and of course the very video with that white horse running through the town there, very interesting as we see this here, and, uh, and uh, of course, you got the black horse, and then the white horse has got the red drenched on his own little breast there, which made me think of the red horse, right? And so I see this, and that's what inspired me, and I began to, and immediately it came to my mind, Revelation chapter 6, I thought of the seals there, and I knew that white horse, and I knew that that, that particular rider was given a crown. And of course, we know that the British Empire in the 1601, this is when... Britain becomes a crowned empire. And what have they done? See, what have they done ever since then? They have brought so many nations of the world underneath their control. A world system of dependencies, colonies, and pro, uh, protectorates and a territories that over a span of some three centuries was brought under the sovereignty of the crown of the Great Britain and the administration of the British government, the policy of granting or recognizing significant degrees of self-government by dependencies which was favored by the far-flung far nature of the empire led to the development of the 20th century notion of a British commonwealth. That's on Encyclopedia Britannica. They, they don't even make any bones about it. They went forth conquering and to conquer, just like Australia. It is a province of Britain. Uh, they... they went in there and pushed back the indigenous people like they're here in the United States. And really, the United States is no more than another colonial outpost of the British Empire. We are, we are, a, uh, we are a corporation. We're still under the British crown, technically speaking. So it's no wonder why the horse, as he's running, he's white in the video, but the horse happens to be bloody why? Because he is a white horse. He starts off as a white horse, but he becomes the red horse. Why? Because in the, the, uh, the, uh, the, se uh, the second seal, we have here, and when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, come and see. And there went out another horse that was red. And power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth. And they that should kill one another. There was given unto him a great sword. Interesting, isn't it? He's a red horse. He's to take peace from the earth. And they should kill one another. And that's exactly what the United States has done. They have picked up where Britain has left off. And they have gone through the entire world making war and conquering, not just conquering. In this case here, we're not like the British Empire. We go and conquer. See, the, to conquering and to conquer is to take and rule over once you got it, right? We've done a little bit different than what the British Empire has done. We've just gone and waged war. And interestingly enough, they're given a great sword. And I believe in that respect there, even though the sword represents the killing of one another, it also represents the word of God. And so the United States, under the name of Christianity, under the name of Jesus Christ, has waged war. That's our democracy value. We're, we're, we're a nation of Christians, so we go and kill everybody else and take over the whole world, right? That's how evil this has become. You know what's fascinating, right? And, 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 and this is actually something that is being fulfilled right here in the, in the latter days. But this is, in, this is in one of the Egyptian writings. It says, Their kings will be intoxicated with the fiery sword, and they will wage war against one another, so that the earth is intoxicated with bloodshed, and the seas will be disturbed by those wars. Then the sun will become dark. And the moon will cause its light not to cease. The stars of the sky will, can will cancel their circuits. Those things follow after all these wars that are being waged. See, and notice too, as it says in there, their kings will be intoxicated. The British Empire in the United States. They'll be intoxicated with the fiery sword. 
You know, I think of the fiery sword, you know, even like guarded the way of the tree of life. In this case here, they're making sure by their fiery sword that you never know how to get to Jesus Christ, who truly is the tree of life. Instead, they would rather you, you eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil and go back under the bondage of the law of Israel, which I find very fascinating. And I'll, I'll show you why. You go to the next horse rider, right? The third seal. And when he opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see, and I behold, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. You see, that black horse rider, he now controls the economic systems of the world. Black horse. What's interesting, though, is this, this wheat, a measure of wheat for a penny, but three measures of barley for a penny. You know, in and, and uh, one of the books, and I think Philip is the one that wrote it, maybe it's maybe it uh, Thomas, I forget which one now, but they quote Jesus as saying that the barley was given to the animals. The wheat is for man and the barley is for animals. I don't know if there's a significant with this or not, but I find it interesting, especially though in the light of these balances, because we also know the scripture talks about the deceitful balances. And to me, that is going right back to you can't buy or sell, saving you take that mark of the beast. Now that's a conjecture on my part on that one there. But when we get to that fourth seal and that fourth horse rider, there is no doubt in my mind who that fourth seal applies to. And I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And his name that sat on him was Death. And hell followed with him. And power was given unto them. Who's them? Both death and hell. Over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death. And with the beast of the earth. Now I highlighted that last part there in purple intentionally. You see the thing is he has power over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword. The Noahide laws to behead you. With hunger. Because he's going to control all the granaries of the world. Like Joseph did in Egypt. But the difference is here, this time the Antichrist will not be so benevolent as Joseph was. He will take everything you have, not to mention with the war, with death, fourth part of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, and with death. You see, that sword also represents the wars. Just like right now, Israel and Gaza, what are they doing? With the sword, they are waging war, killing these Palestinians by the tens of thousands. And what they're not killing with the sword, they're killing with starvation, with hunger, blockade of food. Remember what the defense minister of Israel said? No food, no water, nothing. No, no nothing, no electricity, no nothing. Many different politicians of Israel have said that the Palestinians are just animals. You know, speaking of that, let me show you a true Jewish person. All right, I want you to see what a true Jewish person is like. All right, this man here is a Holocaust survivor. Listen to what his words are saying here. And he's talking about the protest at the universities around the world, more specifically, though, here in America. As a Holocaust survivor, my message to the brave student protesters in America is just keep doing it. Don't give up. We are doing exactly the same. And in the long term, we are going to prevail. I'm out from the beginning at every march. 
a small group of survivors and descendants of survivors demonstrate disagreement with, with the use of uh, the Holocaust experience uh, as a cover by the Zionists and the State of Israel. What's happening in America's college campuses? I'm going to pause here for a moment, but I'm going to let this part play as well. Because Netanyahu, after he gave this speech here, Within less than 24 hours, the U.S. government began to act on his demands. Silencing freedom of speech in this nation, calling it anti-Semitism. Professors being arrested because no one dare, dare speak against that fourth horse rider. It is horrific. This is reminiscent of what happened in German universities in the 1930s. The way that the Israeli government is using the memory of the Holocaust in order to justify what they are doing to the Gaza is a complete in Gaza. insult to the memory of the Holocaust. And we stand repeatedly in the last few demos carrying placards uh, hanging from the neck saying this survivor of the Holocaust is against the genocide in Gaza. And we also demonstrate against the conflating of Jewishness with Zionism, which is what the Israeli state is trying to do, which does nothing else but increases anti-Semitism. So we are trying to counter that by demonstrating that Jews and Holocaust survivors are against that. We have... I will post the link in the description below for you so you can watch the entire interview there. Also, I will post to the... Um um, I have an article where he speaks of there. There we go, right there. The article that was written about uh, what they're doing. God bless them, you know. But as I mentioned to you, mass graves in Gaza show victims' hands tied, says UN office. Uh, Gaza, Israel, and post starvation, deadly for the children. But there's no care, there's no concern. They keep trying to bring you back, even in the U.S. political circles, of what happened on October the 7th. Why don't you address what, what the lack of response was on October the 7th? You know, what's fascinating, Ben Gavir was in a severe car accident, and they had military police, and I guarantee you it didn't take them eight hours to get to Ben Gavir when he had that car accident. You know, and, and I don't wish any harm to this man. You know, I don't agree with his opinions, but I certainly don't want any harm coming to him. And this is what they had to do to protect him when he's coming out of some meeting. And this is the, this is the, the people that are protesting Ben Gavir. He's waving like he's their fans. They're not fans. They're protesting him because their loved ones are held by Hamas. And all they're doing is dropping bombs and killing everybody instead of negotiating with Hamas. You know, what a difference, you know, and probably could have got the, 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 the survivors back home long ago rather than carpet bomb the entire Gaza Strip. You have to ask yourself what's really going on, right? Let's go back to Revelation chapter 6 here. Let's continue on. So, and notice though, they kill with the sword, with hunger, and with death, and with the beast of the earth. The beast of the earth. What, why do I bring that up, all right? Let me, let me remind you of why, right? Let's, let's take Rabbi Ariel, hang on, oh, got to get it in there. Rabbi Ariel Say, Doc, you remember him? Remember him in, in the uh, kosher school that he has there? And, uh, and, and, and do you remember his, his message that he does? Uh, and I don't know if it's anywhere near this, some of the top ones here, but he talks about help. He talks about the seraphim being reptilians. He says they live in inner earth and they're going to come up from out of inner earth and they're going to help Israel. That's why Revelation 6 says, and they kill with not just, not just with death and with the beast of the earth. The reptilians. Yeah. And when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. 
And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? I believe this goes back to the early apostles, the early believers that lost their lives because of the hatred towards Christians in the beginning. I believe that's what that was. They were all given white robes and they were told that they must rest yet a little season until their fellow servants also, their brethren, that should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. Because remember, according to the fourth seal and that fourth horse rider, he's going to kill with sword and with hunger. He's going to bring out those Noahide laws. Israel is the pale horse. Great Britain is the white horse. The, the, the excuse me, um, and the red horse is the United States of America. And that black horse is a combination of both Great Britain, United States, and Israel, controlling the economics of the world. But that black horse is none other than Israel. And Israel working with, working with, uh, get down to it. Who, 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 who is he with? Death is on him, and hell followed with him. It is, I know it sounds crazy, but just look at what's going on. Let's continue on. That was the fifth seal. Let's go now to the sixth seal. And I behold, and when, I'd opened the, and when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black, a sad cloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. If you remember, I just read to you, after the kings are intoxicated with the fiery sword, then what happens? Even the seas are disturbed by those wars. Think about what's going on down in the southern hemisphere with those 70 and 80 foot waves and all of a sudden it happens again. I did that special message. I released it here. It's normally, it was on Patreon originally. And by the way, I'm going to be releasing another video here on Patreon coming up. Patreon.com forward slash Israeli News Live. Good way to support this broadcast. But it says then what happens after that? The stars of the sky will cancel their circuits and great clap of thunder will come out of a great force that is above all the forces of chaos and the firmament. Um, it actually talks about how that the, firm, the, 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 the heavens will collapse down upon one another. Not only that one. Let me, let, me, let me show you another one here. Let's see. The waters and the springs of the earth will cease. Then the depths will be laid bare and they will open. The stars will grow in size and the sun will cease. Now this is the beautiful part. Jesus speaking, And I shall withdraw with everyone who will know me. And they will enter into the immeasurable light where there is no one of the flesh nor of the wantonness of the first to seize them. And they will be unhampered, holy since nothing drags them down. Let's see. In those days, the earth will not be stable. Men will not sail the sea, nor will they know the stars in heaven. Every sacred voice of the word of God will be silenced, and the air will be diseased. Such is the uh, senility of the world, atheism, dishonor, and the disregard of noble words. Now notice though what he says. Every sacred, the, excuse me, the sacred voice of the word of God will be silenced. Now that brings us after, because basically what's happening, we see this one here in the sixth seal, and the kings of the earth, the great men and the rich men and the chief captains, mighty men and every bondman and every free man and hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains. That's what they're doing because they're worried about planet X coming, right? And said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us, hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne from, from the wrath of the Lamb. The great day of his wrath has come and who shall be able to stand? By the way, though, that silencing of your voice, that's what, that's what Israel's trying to do right now. Blaming it on anti-Semitism. All right, but we have to go all the way to Revelation chapter 8 in order to get to um, the seventh seal. Oh, there we go. 
And when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of a half an hour. And people have always wondered, what does that mean? The only thing that I've ever been able to figure out on that is the scripture, and I didn't think to pull it up in time. It's where, let all the world keep silent, for he has risen up. Let me, let me do it. He's risen up out of his holy habitation. Here we go, Zechariah 2.13. And the Lord, we'll go to verse 12 first. And the Lord shall inherit Judah, his portion in the holy land, and shall choose Jerusalem again. Be silent, O all flesh, before the Lord, for he is raised up out of his holy habitation. You see, yes, the two houses come back together, but it's not like what you think. But when he raises up out of his holy habitation, and there's more than one scripture on that, by the way. I'm just sharing that with you. That's what the silence in heaven for the space of a half an hour is. It's when Jesus Christ raises up. That's when everything goes silent. I just kind of skimmed over the surface right now because I'm excited about this. But take time. Look at it. And I trust it'll bless your heart in some way. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live.